Um, so um, a topic came out, which I thought was really interesting. It's something that uh, particularly Anka and I have been talking about for a long time, but other people we've been talking about, and that is the significance of 9-11 to what's happening today. And 9-11 uh, is, I think, in American history, in modern American history, uh, is, a, is, a, is a key event, is a pivotal event, and I think to a large extent is shaping the world in which we live today. And I want to go over some of the ways in which uh, that manifests itself and uh, in, in some of the consequences that I think have come about uh, because of 9-11 and, uh, and kind of the response to 9-11. Because, well, it's really, I think the pivot is not so much 9-11. Uh, I think uh, the, the real impact on the culture is how a political class responded to 9-11, how the culture responded to 9-11. And that has really paved its way to what we're experiencing now. So, so, let's, so let's talk about that. I'll remind everybody you can ask questions on pretty much anything. I'm known to answer questions on pretty much anything. And you, to do that, you can use the Super Chat, uh, the Super Chat feature uh, on, um, in YouTube. It, it's just a button at the bottom there. It's easy to do. Uh, you can also use that to support the show and uh, to support what I do. Uh, this is, uh, these funds uh, uh, make the show possible. All right. Uh, really, what they do is they make it make it possible for me to devote the time I need for the show because the the actual this setup doesn't cost that much money. What costs money is my time. So uh, let's talk about nine eleven. So we'll divvy it up into a number of different buckets. So let's start with the idea that to this day it is a complete and utter mystery to our political and to some extent our cultural elites who actually attacked us in 9-11 I, I don't think there's any conception of who that is there's this vague notion that it was terrorists um, but that's about it terrorists attacked us on 9-11 and as a consequence we need to fight terrorism we're the terrorists it, it's and it's it's really interesting because it's the first maybe not the first big lie, but certainly it's the big lie that has defined kind of our culture, I think, in the 21st century. If you, after 9-11, suggested, as many of us did, that maybe Islam had something to do with it, oh, no, God forbid, no. You know, George Bush invites Muslim imams to the White House to celebrate the Ramadan a month after 9-11? Right, in October of, 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 of uh, 2001, in his famous speech to a joint, uh, joint uh, a session of Congress, Islam is a religion of peace? God forbid you mention the, 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 the term Islam. Now, think about that in the context of conspiracy theories. When Now, everybody knew they were Muslim, right? <laughs> All of them, every single one of the terrorists. And that Islam was not an accidental feature of the attack. That indeed the attack was done in the name of Islam. But it wasn't even, our politicians couldn't even say, it's radical Islam, militant Islam. I mean, we gave them a million different terms that they could use. We used the, uh, the term totalitarian Islam, Islamists, jihadists. Something that would link this to the religion, God forbid. And it was God forbid, because remember, George Bush was religious, and of course the left didn't want to insult anybody, you know, that, and the right is religious, they don't want to blame religion. Religions, all religions are peace. All those millions of people who've died in religious wars, no, I mean, terrorists. Was it warriors? It's wars. God forbid, again, you can't net name religion. As, as the source, as the cause, as the motivation for any uh, atrocity that's ever happened. So what you get is this silence. And you're not allowed to say certain things. And you're canceled if you do say certain things. And if you think about the first protests on campuses of, of speakers, uh, I remember being with... Um, 
I don't think they were protesting me as much, but I was with Daniel Pipes. I did a lot of events in those days. I don't know if you guys know who Daniel Pipes was, but it, Daniel Pipes of the Amidis Forum was excellent after 9-11 as an analysis and his, his uh, analysis of what happened. Not quite as good as, as, as Diane Rennie Institute, but, but really, really good. And we would do events with him, but he was known as you know, the so-called Islamophobe. No, notice Islamophobe, you're afraid of Muslims, so you blame on everything. What a bizarre term. But um, the demonstrations, the attempts to silence, uh, I was attacked more uh, by people after 9-11 in talks that I gave all over the country, uh, interrupted, attacked, than I ever was by Antifa or, or in, in, in more modern times by, by uh, the modern left. Um, in Irvine, I gave a talk, I can't remember what year it was, maybe six or seven. Um, you know, uh, I, literally they stormed the stage. Uh, a bunch of them spent the night in jail. Luckily, I, I had really good security. The Irvine police were there, and they clamped down on these guys, and they put them in handcuffs, and they, they, they immediately whizzed them off. To, so these guys were prepared. Um, but it was scary in those days. I, you know, I, I don't know how often, I, how often I've said this, but you know, I don't know if you guys know, but I used to wear bulletproof vest um, in the post-9-11 when I used to talk about foreign policy stuff. That's how, because I, we would get death threats. Uh, again, people would demonstrate and threaten and... and uh, the, you know, in all kinds of ways, and uh, so um, my my wife and my um, chief administrative officer at the Iron Man Institute insisted that I wear a uh, bulletproof vest. So I, I accommodated their wishes. I would travel all over the world with a bulletproof vest when I when I spoke uh, on um, uh, on uh, terrorism, foreign policy, morality of war, Israel, all of those things. It, it was one of these you wear under a shirt, so most people couldn't tell. So if you look at the video, you won't be able to tell. But uh, security guys would always tell. They would look at me and say, you're wearing a vest, right? Uh, and, um, and the answer was yes. Yeah. So given, you know, given the death threats, given the attacks, much worse than anything we've experienced since then, Elon, I mean, the threats he got over, over what? Over identifying Islam as a source of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, I mean, uh, they were going to you know, decapitate him and his family. I mean, it was scary. It was scary at the institute in the in the uh, first ten year in the first ten years after nine eleven. Uh, so, and of course, we got no support from the intellectuals, with the exception of people like Daniel Pipes. Think about what happened during the Danish cartoons. Again, many of you are too young to remember the Danish cartoons. But when the Danish cartoons came out, there were demonstrations and riots all over the world. Um, George Bush, um, in his uh, Im immense courage, uh, said that, yeah, you know, it's inappropriate to publish the cartoons because it it's offensive, so we shouldn't really do it. The, no newspaper in the United States would run the cartoons. They all chickened out. They all were afraid. Um, we went on campuses. Um, we blew the cartoons out to massive posters. And uh, we went on campuses and put them up on stage behind us and did panels and free speech. Uh, during the cartoon, uh, the Danish cartoon crisis. Now you know I wore bulletproof vest. Um, and, and people would freak out, and the universities would freak out. And the universities in, at NYU, uh, New York University, uh, they, they uh, allowed us to do the event only if we didn't show the cartoons, and if we only allowed students in, did not allow the general public in. So we landed up doing the event with the cartoons in the back all covered with sheets, which was actually more effective because here was the silencing that we were talking about. Um, in some places, wouldn't provide security. Uh, they wouldn't protect our right to speak, even though we were legitimate and, and invited and people were, were, were uh, threatening violence. Uh, so the whole attitude about the certain things you can't say, think about woke culture, certain things you just can't say, you're, you're offensive to a particular group, Muslims in this case. That got really embedded in American culture around the issue of Islam after 9-11. I don't think there was this attitude. I mean, there was some political correctness in the 90s, but there was no, oh, you can't offend X, Y, Z. You can't say anything to offend them. You can't name certain groups in certain contexts. And if you think about today, you can list all the groups that you can't offend, you can't name, you can't do anything.
So, you know, that's one dimension. I think the dimension of speech, um, uh, self-censorship. Think about how many people in the 2000s started to self-censor, started to talk about terrorists without naming the terrorists, started talking about uh, what motivated them, what drove them. I mean, think about we engaged in multiple wars without ever naming the enemy, refusing to name the enemy. Like, who's there? We're going to Iraq, why? Because terrorists attacked us on 9-11. What does Iraq have anything to do? Oh, they have weapons of mass destruction. What does that have to do with 9-11? Blank. Nothing. Right? We, we, we're going to de build democracy in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Why? Because we were attacked in 9-11. What does that have? Make the world a safer place. For whom? From whom? Blank. N nothing. And of course, in Iraq, we brought in all the tribal leaders, let them write an Islamist constitution with Islam everywhere in it, and we said nothing. Yeah, whatever, whatever you guys do, want to do, that's fine. You can keep your Islam, because you know, Islam had nothing to do with 9-11, so that's okay. We, we just happen to attack a bunch of Islamic countries, but we want to preserve Islam. We don't want to do anything about Islam. We just, you know, just don't worry, be happy. Uh, everything's fine. So everybody, think about a culture where everybody knew Islam had something to do with it, but nobody was willing to say it. All the intellectuals, all the political leaders, all the, quote, elites were silent, refused to talk about it, self-censored. And the rest of the people are looking at this and saying, what the hell? We know what happened. We get what happened. And you won't tell us. And I think that's the, it's not the beginning because everything has been building up over decades, but it really is a major, uh, a, a major step towards the distrust of elites, the distrust of the media, the distrust of our political class, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that they're so brazenly lying to us and so brazenly self-censoring and forcing us to self-censor as well. And again, that whole attitude towards the elites, towards our politicians, that has, you know, increased as we've, uh, as we've moved into um, today's uh, culture. It's all over the culture today. Uh, so, so it's, it's, Two aspects of this came out of 9-11. The, the, the self-censorship uh, speech issue and the distrust issue. The distrust issue. We stopped trusting the so-called authorities, the so-called people who supposedly knew what they were doing. Uh, this includes our generals and it includes the entire establishment would not tell us who actually committed the 9-11. Uh, and, it, it, and of course it continued, right? Because there were terrorist attacks after 9/11, and there were, you know, in, in there were terrorist attacks before 9/11. There was the coal, there was others, and uh, never blaming anybody. And of course, Europe is even worse, because there they have more. They had more terrorist attacks, at, le at least in terms of numbers. I'm not sure in terms of casualties if they, if they got to the level of 9/11, in terms of percentage of the population. I don't think so, even cumulative. But it was major, right? There was a train in uh, there was a train in Spain, you know, pretty quickly after 9/11. There, uh, the, the, and then there was a bunch from ISIS later on, and you can never say that this was caused by Muslims. And of course, Europe caved completely to the Danish cartoons, and we saw what happened. What was the other big event with regard to cartoons, right? In France. Charlie Hebdo, right? Charlie Hebdo, remember the terrorist went in, killed all the cartoonists, shot the place up, and everybody went out in the streets, we are Charlie Hebdo, je suis, you know, Charlie, remember that, je suis Charlie, on Twitter, everybody changed their hand to the je suis uh, 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 Charlie. How many of those people showed cartoons? Because if you're Charlie Hebdo, isn't it incumbent on you to show the cartoons? Isn't that what it means to be Charlie Hebdo? Almost nobody. Nobody posted them on Twitter. Nobody posted them on Facebook. Nobody, nobody, because you can't offend. Even though they just murdered a bunch of people. And you can't name the religion. You can't name the cause. So that is such a massive betrayal of 
the American people, uh, the European people, it's such a massive betrayal by the people in charge of all of us. They're supposed to be in charge of protecting us. Our trust and the ability to protect us goes out the door when they won't even name the enemy. They won't even name who attacked us. They refuse to do it. So that's one aspect. I think everything comes from that, in a sense. Because if you don't name the enemy, how do you fight it? You can't. It's a haphazard, you know, uncoordinated, unintegrated uh, attempt to fight a bunch of different groups that you can't tie together because you can't name what ties them together. You leave a lot of groups that are affiliated with the actual event, with radical Islam or Islamic totalitarianism. You leave them free because you can't attack them because they gave you no cause, supposedly, because Islam is not responsible. So you go to Afghanistan, but what are you doing there? What's the purpose? Who are you trying to kill? It, you know, are you going after Taliban or are you just out going after Al Qaeda? And if you're going after both for the purpose of what? What's going to replace the Taliban? Are, are we going to stay there? Are we going to leave? No answers. Nobody knows. We go to Iraq. What's the connection? Why do we care? Why are American kids dying in Iraq? For whom? For what? What's the connection with the attack? Are we then going to go to Iran, which might, you could argue, is the origin of the problem? No, they tell us, and no, they, indeed they didn't. Indeed, they handed Iraq to the Iranians. A complete disastrous policy that led to defeat. We lost Afghanistan. We lost Iraq. I don't know, 6,000 American kids died for no reason, uh, soldiers in both, uh, in both missions. We failed. You know, somebody says Saudi Arabia. No, Saudi Arabia is our friend. Saudi Arabia is our ally. Oh, but it's Saudi Arabia's ideology that fuels the terrorists? Well, but you can't say that. There is no ideology. They're just terrorists. That's it. It's no ideology. So we can't blame the Saudis, and we can't go after the Saudis, and, and 16 of the terrorists were Saudis. Oh, that doesn't matter. Just accident. Just happened to be from Saudi Arabia. They could have been from, you know, uh, uh, New Guinea. Right? They could have been from anywhere. So Saudi's our friend. It's an ally in the war on terrorism because it's just terrorism. So the failure, the American failure, the American defeat, and we should call it a defeat, um, in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, by basically the, the worst elements within Islam, has infected our culture with, you know, multiple things. One, no self-esteem. America is no longer exceptional. There's nothing special about America. Uh, the wars are not just because they're never explained. So we're just like Russia invading Ukraine. I see that all the time from conservatives and, left and, and liberals. Putin's not particularly bad. He's not worse than America. America went into Iraq. He's going into Ukraine. What's the difference? There's no difference, right? And since it was never explained, since it was never justified, and since we left it a bigger mess than when we came, arguably, what is the difference? Afghanistan, what did we do there? Nothing. Taliban was there before. Taliban is there now spent 20 years there and did zilch, nothing, except get a lot of Americans killed. I, I reviewed on my show a few months ago, years ago, I can't tell, uh, the movie Outpost. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Outpost. I highly recommend it. Um, it's just, it, 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 it's a fantastic movie that illustrates, it's a true story, based on a true story of an outpost in Afghanistan. The utter, the utter, uh, What's the words? Um, disregard our politicians and our generals have towards American soldiers. They don't care. They're just fodder. They're just fodder for political games, for diplomatic games, for the for the for the for the for the you know for for whatever the generals and the politicians come up with. Uh, this is an outpost that there was no reason for American troops to be there, and they were there clearly at a disadvantage versus the Taliban. And they were going to die, and they were going to be killed, and everybody knew it. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. And, and the movie kind of shows that and shows the battle. 
Um, and uh, it's heart-wrenching. Your, your, your cry of outrage over, over our politicians and the disregard they had for American lives. They have a lot of disregard for Afghan lives. Lots of regard for Afghan lives. Complete disregard for American lives. Same happened in Iraq. Massive regard for Iraqi lives. Complete disregard for American lives. And Americans became cynical, became cynical about the government, became cynical about foreign policy, became, um, you know, became cynical about their own country. We uh, lose a country. We can't win a war. We haven't won a war since World War II. Uh, you know, the, these are primitive, barbaric cultures. We can't even beat them. Uh, why were we even there? What were we trying to achieve? Well, we didn't achieve anything. Uh, and everybody knows we didn't achieve anything. And now with Biden retreat, I mean, it was perfect. What Biden did was actually perfect, the perfect ending for, for Afghanistan. Since it was a fiasco from day one, it's appropriate that it's a fiasco at the end. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.